is a foreshadow of Jesus Christ who wasn't going to do this just once a year. He was going to do this once forever. And so that blood that was sprinkled on that mercy seat has, is intrinsically associated with atonement and the idea of union. The sacrifice was the person. And so when that person's blood is on that mercy seat, that's the person's death that's there. That's the offerer's some kind of connection here. But why is it on a mercy seat? Why is it where God speaks? Because that mercy seat, with cherubims around it overshadowing, I'm going to show you scriptures to prove this, represents the very throne of God, and we are seated together with him in heavenly places, and we wouldn't be there if it wasn't for that atonement. We wouldn't be there if it wasn't for our sacrifice, Jesus Christ. But because there became a union of us and Jesus Christ, who is our atonement, that whole atonement, that entire union, is the basis of everything God has for us right now in the kingdom of God. We are in the kingdom, but we're not just in the kingdom we're sitting with Jesus Christ on his throne hallelujah only because of our union and our identity to him can you see how that represents the kingdom of God the whole message and that was the center of everything in the Old Testament Jerusalem was oft spoke about but it was only because the temple of God would be there and it was only because the ark would be in the temple where God's presence was as I come into his presence, hallelujah, Brother Luther, that was wonderful, coming into the holiest of holies. When we come into this revelation of the kingdom, we're going to rest exactly the way Brother William said we're going to rest. Amen. We're going to understand things exactly the way we're supposed to understand them. It's what God saved us to experience. It was God's, what God saved us to be, where God saved us to place us. Right there in this place, it was from the beginning when God wanted Adam to rule on the earth. And there's an escapist mentality today that's killing the doctrine of the kingdom. Get me out of here. Get me out of this world. When Paul said, it's more expedient, I stay with you than I go to be with the Lord. Amen. And where Jesus said, I don't pray you take them out of the world, but keep them in the world. Keep them. Keep them safe. Hallelujah. And I think of the ark under the covering protection of God in, in this world, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Christ the devil would like to get us out of here because the devil knows more about the kingdom maybe than we do but we were saved to rule in this world we were saved to rule in this world God said Adam I want you to have dominion in the earth and just as he's the image of God and God rules in heaven the reflection on this earth now we know earth is a reflection of the things unseen there's a river of life there's a tree all of these things are physically interpreted in the earth. And God wants us. He doesn't want us to get out of here right now. He wants us to work in the kingdom and see his glory manifested. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so when that high priest sprinkled that blood on that mercy seat, death was symbolically shown as being conquered. The very thing Sin that separated us from our God and brought death is conquered because Jesus is our high priest and he resurrected and with his own blood he went into the holiest of holies not made with hands and he sat down on what this ark represents. Somebody say the throne of God. Let's situate that Psalm 110 in the New Testament. Again, here's the quote more than any other Old Testament verse quoted in the New. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now the New Testament situates this prophecy in the time after Jesus' resurrection and ascension 
And he's in that heavenly place according to Hebrews 10 and 12. But this man, after he had one sacrificed one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now that's exactly what Psalms prophesied. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now isn't that what Psalm 110 said? For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So after he offered that sacrifice of himself, Hebrews says that's when Psalm 120, 110 was fulfilled. He sat down on the right hand after he offered the sacrifice. And on the day of Pentecost, I briefly mentioned it, but Peter said this too in the great outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2 and 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne, his throne. Jesus is on the throne of David already. Jesus is on the throne of David already. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, Christ, was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, and here's Psalm 100, and being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, because he's there, because Psalm 110 is fulfilled, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. This Holy Ghost thing that the noise was noised all around Jerusalem, that they came to see. What's this tongue talking? What's this going on over there in that upper room? And the whole city came out. And Peter said, you want to know why this is happening? Because Jesus is on the right hand throne right now. And He's shedding this forth as you stand there. He's shedding this forth as you hear me. He's pouring out His Spirit. Hallelujah. And folks, it's all to do with the kingdom in the Holy Ghost. That was the very focal point of Peter's whole explanation of why they were talking in tongues. And it has to do with the most oft-quoted verse in the Old Testament. And I'm telling you, God has some words and truth packed into Psalm 110. And the more we open our understanding by the power of God, I believe the more we're going to function as the church is supposed to function in this world. I'm excited. It's like an adventure to me. I'm finding truths I never knew. I'm finding realms in Jesus I never realized. Church is not boring at all. Hallelujah. And in fact, when you think you're getting so much, I I was studying and so much was pouring into me, I couldn't write fast enough to get it down. And you think, wow. And then God says, you haven't seen anything yet. Hallelujah. And oh, Oh, Lord, heal our brains. Hallelujah. They say man only uses 10% of his brain. My, my, my. I think you get in the Holy Ghost, God might open more of it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and so, this was mentioned on the day of Pentecost. And so, the Bible speaks as though we, just like Jesus, have to present ourselves in the holiest of holies, as though we, just like Jesus, were alive from the dead. And this is tied into the kingdom concept. Man, if we could get this, if we, like Brother Brett said last night, if we could just see where we really are in God's eyes and stop speaking these negative things that the devil's putting in there and get these truths of God in there and start speaking them, My, what kind of things can we do in this world? Look at this. 